السلام عليكم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله All praise is surely due to Allah We send the prayers in peace of Allah upon his final messenger Muhammad upon him be all forms of peace um, Now that we've covered a couple of words three words uh, some terminology I want to talk briefly about the content of Islam the trial which we all face in seeking the truth in, is getting distracted from the real issues with the trivial issues. Because the content of Islam, the message of all the messengers of Allah, of whom there were thousands throughout the history of mankind, 25 of whom we know by name, all of whom came with the same teaching from the same source. We Muslims, we have a natural aversion when we hear somebody say, the Lord of this place, or the Lord of this people, or the Lord of this age, when there is no such thing. There is only, there is only one Lord. And this is very, very serious. Or let me put it this way. If you don't believe it yet, let's just say, even if it's one in a million, why would you take that chance? Why would you not spend a little time in your life and say, is there any credibility to this claim? It's a very, maybe it's an outrageous claim to you. And especially if you are a product of Christian culture, it's natural for a rational person to want to throw this away. Because so much of what was given to you was so irrational. And because the religion of Paulism, which has nothing to do with Isa, the son of Maria, who is erroneously called Jesus, and that's not his name. His name is Isa, not just in Arabic, in his own language, maybe a slight variation in pronunciation. His name is not Jesus. We shouldn't even say this name, because one of the most prominent theories about this name Jesus is that it's an acronym. It's an abbreviation. And what it stands for is may his name be forever forgotten and never remembered. Now let me explain this. These, these were not malicious people who referred to him in these, this way. These were Jews who were monotheistic. And the true teachings of Isa had been lost to the world. And the polytheistic teachings of Paul and his cronies had assumed the name Christianity. And the Jews who still understood the Shema, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one God, naturally and of course absolutely abhorred this pagan belief of a deity with an offspring and three in one and one in three. This is absolute apostasy. This is absolute antithesis of the message of Abraham and Moses and Daoud and Adam and Noah, Noah and every prophet through the ages. You cannot get farther from the message of the messengers to say God had a son. Or part of God is God and part of God is a human being walking on the earth, eating and excreting. You can't get farther from that. So in their shock and abhorrence at this innovation, this horrific myth that had been perpetrated and falsely attributed to the noble messenger Isa, the son of Maria, some of the Jewish scholars in their writings, instead of writing any name at all, used to write, may his name be effaced and never remembered. And they didn't mean to insult Isa, the son of Maria, or maybe the knowledge had gotten lost and they no longer even realized that this man was a prophet and a messenger of Allah. But what they were hearing was this horrific polytheistic abomination of deities having offspring and being split in three parts and reunited back to one part. And so they called him, may his name be effaced and never remembered. And this was eventually truncated down to Jesus. His name is Isa. Let's call him by his name. May the greatest peace of Allah be upon the messenger Isa, one of the five greatest ever. So, as I said, this question is so serious. Don't get distracted by a 
legacy of Christianity which turned religion into a monster, which boiled people in oil and burned them in the st at the stake and committed genocide in the Middle East, no, the first one, a long time ago, and all of these horrific things so that rational people said, we have to get rid of religion. Well, you can't get rid of it because people won't give it up. So push it to the side. And it has nothing more to do with real life. And actually, that was part of the content of Paulism in the first place. Because he abolished the law. Asa, the son of Mariam, upheld the law. Although some changes and modifications were decreed by the Creator in his mission. But in general, he upheld the circumcision, he upheld the dietary laws, he upheld the moral and sexual laws of the prophets before him. But not Paul. Paul said, all you need is faith without deeds. And it's all in your heart, and it's just a fuzzy feeling, and it's just whatever. Because he had to appease the Romans, because the beef between the followers of the prophet and the Romans was that the Romans said, Caesar is God, and Caesar is the law. And if you have any other law besides Caesar, we're going to cut you in pieces and nail you onto trees and, and do what horrific things. Go read the history. It's beyond belief. All right? So the content of Islam is that we testify to two things. First, we testify, we say, Ashhadu an, that means I testify that. So put that aside to the content La ilaha illallah Now you already know most of these words because he defined them for you La, there is no Ilaha, what does that mean? Anybody remember? What's ilaha mean? Ilah, what does it mean? A God with a small g if you will La ilaha illa except Allah Now the first thing we testify to is there is no ilah. Now, no, he said we can't translate Allah. As a matter of fact, we can't even translate ilah into English. Because ilah means someone who is an ob something which is an object of ta'li. Which means that you revere and obey and submit to and worship this object. That's an ilah. And that's why you find people translating it differently. Some people say, no God but Allah. And some people say, no God but God. Well, that's confusing. All right? But, and some people say, no deity but God or Allah. And you're trying to clear it up a little bit. And some say, none worthy of worship but Allah. So they're, they're trying to get at a meaning, which again, is impossible in English. La ilaha means, do not make ta'li. Do not make this act of... Well, we all know what it is. Mankind has had this since day one. There's Until this century, there's very few human beings who don't believe in a deity. That was never the issue. The issue was monotheism versus intercessors and intermediaries and all that. In our century now, we have a lot of people saying, eh, no such thing. This is fairly unique in human history. There hasn't been many times in human history when anybody said such a thing. Idol worshippers didn't say such a thing. The idol worshippers in Mecca didn't say such a thing. They said, They said, why do you go to these idols? 360 idols in the Kaaba. Why do you go there and give them things and whatever you do there? They said, we only do that to try to get closer to who? Allah. So Muhammad didn't bring this word. They already had the word. Allah. And that's who he was. La ilaha is a negation of ta'li for anyone else. And Allah, in this instruction to us, put negation before affirmation. We don't say, Allah is my Lord and no other. No. We say, no other but Allah. He put negation first. Why? Because the essence of the message of all the prophets is to free yourself from slavery to all false objects, to the pure liberation of pure slavery, to the one and only Ilah. And the one and only Ilah, his name is Allah. And always was. The language is varied, Elohim, I don't know what, but his name always was Allah. The one and only.
So we put negation before affirmation. This is very interesting. Why is that? That's because the human soul is very clingy. The human soul always attaches itself to something. So if it's not a law, it might be the race for money, it might be another individual, probably of the opposite sex, what we call love, it might be anything, but the human soul tends to attach. It's very clingy. It wants to hook onto something and say, this is the meaning of my life. And that's why negation comes before affirmation. We say, before you can straighten yourself out, get rid of all clinging to anything except the creator of the heavens and the earth. La ilaha. We negate that first. I'm not going to make ta'li. I'm not going to accept unquestionably legislation from. I'm not going to bow in prostration to. I'm not going to regard as the ultimate authority in every question that arises between me and myself or me and others. Anyone. How does that? That comes first. Illallah. Except for Allah. Then we go on to say, Wa ashadu anna. And I also bear witness that Muhammad Rasulullah. This is an interesting sentence. I bear witness that Muhammad, peace be upon him, is the Messenger of Allah. Technically, we have to say the Messenger of Allah because Allah is definite and this is the law, and Rasulullah becomes a definite type of a, cons- a construct and it's the Messenger of Allah, but not really because. If we say the messenger of Allah in English, it comes out as the only one. And that's not what it means. Alright, so it's, that's another translation problem. I bear witness that Muhammad is a messenger of Allah. Well, yeah, that's what it means, but it didn't exactly say that. Muhammad is the messenger of Allah, now you've got the wrong idea in English altogether. Muhammad Rasulullah means he's, the mes- he's Allah's messenger, let's put it that way. He's Allah's man, certainly not the only one. We have 25 which are named by name in the Quran, messengers of Allah, prophets and messengers. And we have been told in the hadith that in some total there are over 100,000 in the history of mankind. And there are no more after Muhammad, the final seal of the messengers, the first messenger to come to all mankind. None of the others did. They came to their own people, including Isa, the son of Maryam, the one falsely called Jesus. So, I bear witness that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. Now, it doesn't matter whether you like Islamic architecture or the Muslims you met were nice people or not. Don't get distracted by the small issues because the, eternal of your, the eternity of your hereafter is what is at stake here. So the claim that is being made is that, first of all, there is a deity. If you haven't got past that, work on that. I'm, I'm gonna, there's a couple questions that I'm advising you to work on. Not for my sake, for your own sake. And the ideal situation is that you would work on them one at a time and you'd get to where you need to go. But that's not reality. You might have to work on this one a little bit and then work on this and they might overlap and say, well, uh, if Muhammad's really a messenger, let me look at his message and see if it, you know, see if that strikes me the right way. Probably not the best course, but some people need to do that. At the same time, you're working on the fundamental issue. Is there any lack? Does this creation have a creator or not? Or was it, you know, a million ping pong balls in a box and, and, and some initial motion, as some people put it, just, you know, somehow all these molecules came together and now we can form sentences? Uh, seems very far-fetched to me. Uh, I think that's the, uh, that's the exotic tale, not, not, the, not the issue of a deity. So you need, to, you need to decide, you need to find out, is this true? Is there a deity? And that will get you to la ilaha illallah, because if there really is a deity, and if he has orders for you, if he has a way he wants you to be in this life, you would have to be insane not to want to know what it is. If you decide that there is indeed a deity. But we have to get to the second half. And that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. Never mind Muhammad for a minute. Just a minute, no more. But never mind Muhammad, peace be upon him, for a minute. Messenger of Allah. This is a profound declaration. This is saying that this deity... This Ilah, this creator of the heavens and the earth, spoke to mankind. 
This is very different from the sort of materialistic understanding, even whether there's a God or not, that all this stuff just sort of happened and the swamp bubbled and there was amoebas and it evolved and then there was us. This is a real different sort of scenario. And you, every one of you, needs to decide and really understand, is this possible? Do I believe this? What does the data suggest? And to, 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 do, to do that, you have to really widen your scope. Many of us have a very narrow scope. And we say, oh, women should be free and equal to men, and uh, the economy should be capitalist, or maybe socialist, or maybe something in between. And therefore, if any message comes to me that doesn't match that, I know it's false. So you've decided up front the truths of the heavens and the earth, and now when a message comes to you, you're going to judge based on what you already decided. Not a very wise position, if there's any possibility that these two suppositions are true. Those two suppositions being that there is a creator, number one. Number two, that he, he, I'll get back to that, spoke to mankind. Spoke to mankind through Abraham, through Moses, through Isa, the son of Maryam, through Muhammad, through Noah, and others that we don't even know about. That's the proposition. If you convince yourself that it's not true, then these are a bunch of myths and you don't need to bother yourself. You can go back to just the politics of well, how are we going to defeat these people and get their oil and uh, keep everything in order. But if there's any possibility that it's true, then you owe it to yourself to find out. And as I said, you might have to jump around. Let me, let me entertain this deity thing for a minute. Do I believe there's a deity? Hmm. How would I pursue that? Let me see. And you might want to go read some of the Quran and, and ponder everything you've ever heard that relates to it. And, and work on that decision. Work on that decision because everything in the environment is definitely pushing you away from it. It's, 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 it's actually uh, censored and banned in every university in America. Yeah, every university in America is mandatorily atheist. Because if you write any kind of scholarly work about anything, about history, about archaeology, and you posit, or you, you assume in your analysis, or even not, not assume, if you even allow for the possibility, if you see, okay, uh, the Muslims had a story about Maryam, the mother of Asa, being in a room and food coming to her in the, out of season. And her guardian come in and said, how'd you get this? And she would say, it's from Allah, he gives whatever he wishes. Christians never heard of this story, at least for 400 years minimum, prior to Muhammad, peace be upon him. When the Muslims came in, they like, what are you guys talking, how dare you speak about our man? We have his stories here in the Bible. Many, many years later, actually within the last century, within the last 50 years, I believe, some of the scrolls that were discovered, that were written more than 400 years before Muhammad, and completely lost, uh, around that time or earlier and not known to anyone were unearthed I believe it was in Qumran could have been the Dead Sea Scrolls and there was the story Maria, the mother of Isa was in her chamber and food appeared that was out of season and her guardian came in and said where did you get that? and she said it's from Allah he gives whoever he will now if you're in a university and you write you know what maybe the data here is suggesting a common source all right, that Muhammad got this information from the same source that other people got it from, which is the Ilah, which is Allah. If you were to write such a thing, I guarantee you, you will be de denied your degree, if not removed from the university entirely. So it's not allowed. It's not allowed in U.S. academia to even entertain the notion. But you as an individual should not be held back by that. You should allow yourself to entertain the notion with all your rationality, all your abilities, all your intellect, and decide for yourself. Don't let others decide for you. Is it possible that this world has a creator? Number one, because, as I said, most of mankind, if you take the whole span of mankind, probably 99.99% believe that. It's only in the last century or two that there were any significant numbers of people saying, no, I don't believe that. But that's not the point, because that's not ilah. Okay? The creator, the prime mover, some people called it, I don't know what, the supreme being. That's not the ilah. Remember ta'li? Ta'li is you. This is what you do, not what the deity does. We call that rub. 
or Khalik, we have other words for that, the Creator, the Lord, the one who brings life and brings death and controls everything, controls what's in the universe, we have other words for that. That's not the Ilah. Those terms refer to what the deity does. Ilah refers to what you do. It refers to your worship and submission and obedience to the deity. The second proposition, of course, and this is the more outrageous if you're coming from the outside and you never understood these things before. <coughs> Why on earth would this deity, this creator of all things, this one who is in complete control, why would he create two creatures, us and another creature called the jinn, who aren't always subject to his orders? They're subject to his will, yes, because everything is subject to his will. But he tests them. He cre creates them with a will to choose. And then he sends a road map through a messenger and says, this is righteousness, this is what I want you to do, this is evil, this is what I want you to stay away from. And then waits to see what the result's going to be. Actually, he knows the result ahead of time. But <laughs> That's a weird proposition. That's, a, that's a, a great big proposition if you've never entertained such a thing. So don't get distracted by any other issues, by politics, by cultural issues, by do I like these people, do I not like these people, how do they, how do they treat their women. Don't worry about that yet. Stay focused on the two questions. Do I believe that there's a creator? Number one. And I think most people ultimately do or will. And do I believe that this creator actually sent messages to mankind as a test for us? Now that one's probably a little harder. And these messages are all basically in agreement that we'll face the consequences of what we do in this life and those consequences could be grievous and painful and terrible. And they could be the ultimate opposite of all that. If there's any chance of that, don't you want to know? The book, the final book, sent to Muhammad, peace be upon him. By the way, yes, it is a Qur'an, it is a recitation, but incidentally, it also refers to itself as kitab, which means book. And the amazing thing about this is that Allah let, gave us the knowledge that His final message will be preserved in two ways. And it's preserved every single consonant and vowel in it from the day it came from Allah. And it was preserved in two ways. It was preserved as a Qur'an, which is the majority of it, when it mentions itself, it calls itself Qur'an. And it was preserved as Kitab, as a written book. And a lot of people get confused about this. They say, well, the Qur'an didn't have vowels for a couple of decades, not even diacritics, which distinguish some of the letters from each other. How can you say this book is accurate? The, the written version of the Qur'an could not stand on its own for several decades after the time of the Prophet because it was not the primary means of preservation. It was preserved orally as a recitation. There were dozens and hundreds and thousands of people who could recite it from end to end and check each other and not make any mistake and that's how it was preserved. It was written from the beginning but the written was only uh, uh, notes. It was like, uh, what do you call that stuff? The court reporter. It was a like shorthand. Because a lot of it was ambiguous. You couldn't, there were three letters here you couldn't tell from each other because no one had invented the dots yet. They weren't invented until later. So the, it was not relied on as a written book. It was preserved as a recitation. But eventually the book reached a stage of independence when we got the diacritics and we got the vowels. Now, uh, without the, but the recitation never broke. The chain never broke. It has been preserved until today by dedicated chains of, of narration of recitation. But the written became independent when it got all the vowels and, and now there's no discrepancy between the two. So it was both a book and a recitation. So you need, all of us need, to entertain these questions very seriously, not get distracted in this pursuit because it's really the only important thing. And when you come to realize that this world indeed has a creator, a Rabb, and he is indeed more than that. He is an ilah. He is one who not only has will and power and omnipotence, but also has order and command and things that he dislikes and things that he likes from us. 
and requirements of us, what he wants us to do and be in this world. That's the ilah. And if you get to that level of understanding, then well, what about these messages? And especially the final message, which is preserved intact, you can read it as it came from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and look for guidance in it. If you, if you find this to be true, you cannot call yourself a rational being if you don't run to it and try to see, okay, what does it expect from me? And then the other issues that have been bothering you will become clear and easy to resolve. Okay, I'm going to turn the mic back over to our star attraction here. And uh, please uh, be saving up your questions uh, for the question and answer period after the afternoon prayer, which we'll make after this next segment.